Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Shaheen Gadir with the Fertile Life Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, I have a very dynamic person here with us, a dear friend of mine, uh, Mr. John William Barger, of course, the third. And uh, we are on different coasts of the United States right now. But for those of you who do not know who John William is, he is a TV personality. Um, he is an expert in anything luxurious. So he can just look at you and tell you if you're not luxurious. And he's a very talented person that way. Uh, he has had a uh, show, actually been on shows where he talks about all kinds of lifestyle events and things. But one of the reasons that he's on today is when we met years ago, um, we started to talk about what the path is to parenthood for him. And I want to allow him to introduce himself. And we're going to have a very uh, interesting talk about how someone like John William can go ahead and be an unbelievable dad and teach other people out there that may be in exactly the same shoes as him how they're going to do it as well. How are you? Good. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm really excited that you're here. Um, before I get started, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of introduce yourself and what you're most proud of and what you're doing these days so everyone knows. Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know about what I'm most proud of. Um, as you said, I'm a TV personality. I, I, I contribute to a few television shows on different topics in luxury lifestyle fashion, of course. That's where we met in Paris at Haute Couture many years That's ago. That's right. Fashion and Week we both in Paris. Got, and speaking of fashion, we both got like the denim shirt memo going on today. I don't know why. <laughs> so it's like something in the air. It, that does happen. Um, but, but yeah, so I've been doing that for a long time. Um, I, before that, I used to edit a few magazines, DuPont Registry, uh, among a, a couple others uh, that are some are still, some aren't still in print. Um, doing, you know, fashion, luxury lifestyle, um, you know, high-end homes, celebrity red carpet events, you know, anything that's, you know, not sports. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, if someone's got to do it, yeah, and I so know I, that you, you do a good job doing that. Um, and that, with all the luxurious, fancy things in life and having a beautiful, blessed life, more importantly, um, has led us to talk to the idea of, what to do to start a family. Absolutely. So my personal situation is I'm an only child. I'm single. I've been single for way too long. Um, I need to go on like a matchmaking podcast after this, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, I'm gay, so I'm, you know, a member of the LGBTQ plus uh, community. And, um, you know, for somebody like me, like I know that it's, po you know, it's possible for gay people to have you know, kids now, two guys, it's not a problem. Um, but I don't really know like how the process really works. And then add like sort of like, you know, the twist is I'm single. So it's like being like a single gay dad. It's kind of intimidating, right? Like it's a lot to kind of think about, but you know, I'm over 30. So it's one of those things, you know, I know that the clock doesn't tick as much for men as it does for women per se, but you know, you still, I don't want to be, you know, waiting till I'm 55 to have kids because I don't want to be 70 at their graduation for high school. You know what I mean? So there's a lot there in that little question <laughs> or comment um, that I want to address for sure. And that's why I'm drinking. <laughs> yeah, you can have a drink. I'm having water. You can have a drink. I do want to yeah, say it's that eight o'clock um, in Florida. <laughs> nice on a Friday night. So enjoy yourself um, for any single person trying to conceive um, the there are challenges there's intimidation, there are fears that are completely normal moving forward. Um, I see single women, I see single men, I see single gay and heterosexual individuals that come to my practice all the time. And there's always a level of concern trying to do this alone. But at the same time, I've had unbelievable success helping single individuals that have come back to me and said, you changed my life. I couldn't imagine my life any different right now or any better right now without my child. So it's definitely doable. Now, for anyone who's doing it alone, they're going to need either egg or they're going to need sperm or they're going to need a uterus or a surrogate. Um, for the single gay man like yourself who's trying to do this, I think there's many ways of starting. And there's not one person, whether it's a couple, a single cup, uh, gay man or a gay couple who's coming to my office, that this isn't challenging and there's a lot of steps that people are not familiar with. So the way that we would normally start by beginning this process is that people would schedule a consultation. Um, now more than ever after the pandemic, we are doing consultations virtually. 
and by telemedicine and by phone. So people from all over the country can easily reach out to a doctor that they don't, they don't necessarily uh, live in the same town with but want the top care and do a consultation. During that consultation, we talk a lot about your health. We talk a lot about what's going on in your life and your ultimate goals. I think it's really important for me to know if you just want one child or if you want, you know, four kids. Those are important things to kind of roughly address. None of that is set in stone, but I think it's a good idea. And then the next stepping point for a male trying to do this, whether heterosexual or gay, is to make sure that the sperm looks okay. So we will arrange that the patient comes into the office and does a sperm analysis or they'll go locally to somewhere in their hometown where we can arrange for them to go and do their sperm analysis. Um, and we wanna make sure that there's reasonably good sperm to do this process. So what makes, okay, so let's talk about that. What makes a good sperm? That's, <laughs> like what do you uh, that, so that is that? really important because there are certain categories that we look at on a sperm analysis. Very simple. One is the volume of ejaculation. Normal is over about 1.5 to 2 milliliters. The second is the sperm count. We call it the concentration. We like the concentration to be 20 million or more per milliliter. So if you have two milliliters of sperm, 20 million each, you've got 40 million total sperm. So over 20 million per milliliter is normal. And then we look at the motility, which is how the sperm swims. If the motility is over 50%, that's considered to be totally normal. Sperm are in a, inefficient because there's so many of them. They don't all have to be perfect for them to work well. And then the final category that, in my opinion, is the most important is called morphology. And that's actually assessing how normal a sperm looks. So, for example, when we look at the sperm, we're looking at the head, the neck, and the tail. If the head looks normal, the neck looks normal, and the tail looks normal, and it's progressing normally forward, fashion and not in circles or backwards, we can call that normal morphology. We like the sperm and, and on different kind of measurements and there's different scales. On some scales, it's more than 4%. On our scale in my clinic, it's more than 14%. On some other ones, it's over 30% to be considered normal. So men don't have to have like 95% perfect looking sperm to be considered normal. So in my clinic, if you're over 14% normal morphology, you're doing great and your sperm is of good quality. So basically those are the things, the volume, the count, the swimming and the normal look. Those four things tell us if you've got good sperm or not. Now there's additional tests where they check the DNA well-being of the sperm. I think those are the next level. I don't think the average person needs to do those tests. But at least this gives us a really good idea that, oh, you've got good sperm. You're definitely in the game. We are definitely okay to do this. But at the same time, I was just talking to a patient earlier today. They have zero sperm count. So there are some people that have good sperm, but unfortunately they're missing some of the plumbing or the tubes that get the sperm out. And for that reason, some of our urology colleagues actually have to go into the testicle and remove and aspirate what they call, what we do is to get the sperm out that way and you can still have a beautiful baby that way. Well, I was on swim team, so I'm I'm guessing that, you know, my swim my sperm are good swimmers. So we'll You know, see. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> but let's talk about the drink in your hand. So, there's environmental yeah. things as well that actually can harm sperm. Um, anything that takes testicular temperature up, like steam rooms, jacuzzis, saunas, not very good for you. Um, anything that puts excess pressure on the testicles, like lots of spinning and cycling, also not very good for you. Super tight underwear, super tight pants. Um, I tell everyone at night you shouldn't be wearing those kinds of things when you go to bed or even during the day. But at night in particular, a loose cotton boxer or loose cotton pajamas and no underwear th so things can breathe and get good blood flow going, I think is really important. Um, and again, nothing that's going to take the temperature up and no excessive chemicals. Uh, people are infatuated with asking about marijuana use and sperm. You know, in many places around the country, marijuana is legal. However, the research has shown that there's lots of aspects of marijuana that can harm the sperm morphology or the normal sperm look. So that could be detrimental. Now, the big savior we have here is that men keep reproducing and reproducing sperm, and it takes about 72 to 90 days to get new sperm. So from right this second, John William, you are gonna have new sperm in 90 days. So that drink that you just had now, 
in 90 days could not be, it could does not affect that sperm that's going to be there so uh we have to be careful about being as healthy as you can i think the three months before giving sperm to be used now when we are looking at a single male okay like yourself we're going to also need an egg donor because you need eggs in order to fertilize sperm in order to make an embryo have you ever given thought to an egg donor and how you're going to select that or what you're going to do no and i don't know anything about that process you know talking about like intimidating like okay i know like i have to give my sperm but like you know i i don't know anything about how you even go about you know deciding it's almost like matchmaking right like deciding who's the right egg for you i i don't know so it is who's the right egg for you and people pick on many different ways um some of the ways that people have picked in the past are just physical attributes and certain look that they find attractive or they want to use as the egg. Um, everyone knows that just because you pick someone that looks a certain way, you're not gonna be guaranteed to have a child that looks like that. Um, but it obviously can put you in higher chance of having a child that looks like that. So picking by attribute, we have people that pick by IQ, we have people that pick by religious background, we have people that pick purely by ethnicity. Um, we have, it's what's important for you um, in my office, we have a person called the third party concierge. She actually, if you talk, she will have a conversation, she'll go over everything, and then she'll start doing the search for you. If you wanna do the search yourself, we will recommend you to egg um, donor agencies throughout the country. They usually have online profiles of all of their donors where you can see their pictures. Many of them also these days have videos where you can hear the person answer questions or talk, so you can learn a little bit more about them that way. And then you select the egg donor that you like. So you'll tell me, I like the egg donor X and she seems great. The next thing we will do is we will arrange for her to anonymously, without you being there, coming into our office and doing the FDA screening process. And what that is, is basically all the drug tests and um, smoking tests and all of the urine tests. And we are also able to do genetic screening. Um, we would do the genetic testing on you and also on the egg donor. The current genetic screening panel that we have on you, um, on for individuals, not just for you, but is 283 different disorders. We wanna make sure that you and the egg donor do not carry the same genetic disorder. Um, if you do, there is a way to make sure that the this, because what happens is if two people actually carry the same genetic disorder, one out of every four kids you have, if they get both genes from the egg and the sperm, actually have the disease. You can carry a disorder in your system your entire life and never actually give the disease uh, to anyone. But if two people carry it, there's a high chance of giving that disease onto your child. So there are special tests we can do with IVF to weed the disease out. Or in a situation like yours, we may just recommend pick a different egg donor. So the egg donor does genetic testing, all of the FDA screening tests, and a physical exam, ultrasounds, and also we check her fertility to make sure it's someone that is doing very well. Usually they're between the ages of 20 and 29. Um, and once they have passed the entire screening process, the egg donor will go through a process of having her ovaries stimulated with IVF where they get injections in the belly for about 10 to 12 days, and then the eggs come out. To make this step a little easier, we usually freeze the sperm of the intended father. So at some time, you'd have to come over to, to LA, to my clinic, one time, or you could even freeze your sperm if it's somewhere in the United States and have the sperm shipped to my clinic, and you'd never, you'd never even have to show up there to do this process. But the FDA also requires that you're gonna need to do your FDA blood work and your screening as well and your STD check as well to make as many beautiful healthy sperm available to make your embryos. And then the egg and the sperm are put together in our laboratory and we let them grow for a week making embryos. And at that time, any embryo that grows beautifully for one week gets a tiny biopsy and is frozen. And within a week or two, we will let you know from all your genetically normal embryos, how many men, how many males, how many females. And if you don't wanna know, we don't tell you. And then those are your future offspring and the choices of what you have to put back into a surrogate for the rest of your life. 
So usually, so how many embryos do you typically end up with at the end of this process? Like, what's, so it really depends. I mean, I'm, there I'm are sure some egg donors. I've had like super egg donors that made like fifteen genetically normal embryos, and we have had egg donors that made like just like one or two good embryos. That's why it's important to assess their fertility and make sure that they are are fertile and rather fertile. Um, in many cases, when there are two gay men in a relationship. I really have to go out of my way to make sure that the donor that they're picking is very fertile because if she makes 20 eggs or 30 eggs, we have to then divide them for two people because half of the eggs are going to get inseminated by partner A, the other half of the eggs are going to get inseminated by partner B. So that's why I want to have a very fertile egg donor when we're using two men. Even for one man, I want to make sure that you're not needing to do this more than one time and in an ideal situation, you're done after the first time. So it, it, there are people that are in their 20s that don't have great fertility, and that's sad because people think just because you're young, you have great fertility. And over the years of using a lot of egg donors, I've actually noticed that some women, young women, already have had a decline in their fertility. Wow. Let's back up a little bit, too, to the genetics aspect. I mean, you know, there's so much talk nowadays with, like, CRISPR and gene editing and all this other, you know, sort of, like, bleeding edge of science stuff. You know, how in depth you know as far as like genetic screening can you do both you know on the two uh partners um as well as on the embryos to kind of know what you're getting so that's a great question and i have to say for the purposes of the genetic testing that we do on embryos it's completely different than the genetic blood test that's going to be done on you and the donor okay that's checking for actual diseases and disorders the chromosomal analysis that we do on an embryo is limited. It checks for all 46 chromosomes that every cell in our body has, and that's it. So people are asking if we can edit something or change something or eye color, hair color. Those things are not available in the clinical environment, and I would be very suspicious if the clinic that you are going to says they can do those things. So we check for the genetic well-being of an embryo by the checking the chromosomes, checking for things such as Down syndrome, uh, which is an extra chromosome 21, making sure there are 46 numbers of chromosomes. So we're not at the point yet where you can like pick your child's, like you said, like eye color. Or you are not. Or anything. We are not in my clinic. Okay. And clinically speaking, I have heard of some places that advertise it. I do not know what in the world they're talking about, nor does our lab director or anyone in our reputable lab. Um, so I'd be very weary about any of that. But if you're lucky enough to make both male and female embryos, we give you the opportunity of selecting which embryo, whether it's male or female, to put back into the surrogate. Yeah, okay, so then surrogate, how do you pick your surrogate? You pick your embryo, that's great. You have, you know, you pick your egg, you have your embryo, you know, who's gonna carry it? So that's a really Does good question. Does the donor carry it or do no. you have to find, so the donor, find the surrogate? No, so the donor and the surrogate are two completely different people and we do that for a reason. We want there to be absolutely no attachment in the process of the surrogate knowing that it's, for example, their own child. So that's why it's a different person. I, there's no way to say there's zero attachment between a surrogate who created a human being, but it's not a genetic attachment because it is something that is not genetically related to them. And I think it's really important in this process that the donor be someone and the surrogate another. Now, completely opposite of the donor process, which is anonymous, but I will say these days there are a lot of donors that are actually open to meeting the intended parent. I have a single gay... Uh, patient of mine right now who actually told me the other day, I really love my donor. She has been so supportive to me in this process of me selecting a surrogate that she said to me, if I don't find the right surrogate, she may even offer herself. So I thought that was very special. I don't know if I necessarily agree or don't agree with it. Um, but some people, and it was, and he said, I'm totally open with her knowing my child in the future and my child knowing who the genetic egg came from. So that is actually a very interesting thing that I think people are more and more open to. I think it's a very personal decision that everyone has to decide. Some people may not want the donor to be in the life of their child. And yeah, I completely understand. Yeah, because that's understand. really interesting because it's almost, especially as a single parent, you know, like, you know, kids are gonna probably gonna want to know at some point, you know, where they come from. Um, when you have 
a donor as well as a surrogate, it's kind of like, well, you know, if people do want to have some kind of a relationship with their mom, you know, quote unquote, who who do they make that relationship with? You know, I, I know that's a very gray area with no right answer, but it's, it's you know, you know it's a, a single it's, person. It's another thing to think about. It's a big thing to think about because you just said something and I don't know if you could say that the egg donor is mom. So it may be the biological mother or donor of the egg that created a human being, but it's, I think, in a different way, able to be said that it's a mom. You know, a mom is someone, you know, God bless your mom. I mean, she she was the most loving, one of the most loving, caring, nicest people I've ever met. Um, but a mom is just something more than just giving the egg, I think. And I don't know if a lot of the people that are donating their egg want to necessarily be a mother to the child. So I think it's really important to address that at one time or another. Um, one of the things that we actually do is we require any person in our clinic who's gonna be using an egg donor or a surrogate to have one session um, with a psychologist that specializes in fertility. Not because we're trying to see if someone's crazy or not, but to, for them to kind of address some of these questions that may come up in their head or in the future. And a question like that is a perfect question that has no right, no wrong, but something that I think everyone needs to have thought through at least sometime in their life. So generally, right. most of you, the- As the as the parent, you're making that decision for your kid, whether you like it or not, you know, whatever way you choose. So but there is, are some people else. that have in their contract that at the age of 18, the donor is completely open, for example, for the child to reach out. There are some you know, donors that don't want that. There are some people that they don't even want it in there because they don't want that to be an option. Things have changed a lot. With you know, going online and doing DNA testing and it tells you like who your closest relatives are, it's very, very different than in the past. Yeah. So the surrogate. This is someone that you're gonna actually know and know really well. Okay, it's up to you how close of a relationship you want to have with a surrogate. Um, it's completely up to you in terms of what you want to do in terms of how often you want to reach out to the surrogate. We have had people from foreign countries that don't even speak English have surrogates in the United States and have limited relationships. We have I have had patients that tell me there's not a day that doesn't go by that they're not texting their surrogate just to check in on her and she telling them how she's feeling and how she's doing. So there's lots and lots of different ways of doing this. Um, we have had surrogates that have kept in touch with the intended families and we have had people that after delivery it's a goodbye and there's no more relationship so i think there's a lot involved there um, but you will get a chance to meet your surrogate your surrogate also has to be okay with you so it's not a unilateral i pick her she has to be my surrogate she has to also like you and want to be your surrogate and be okay with the fact that you're single be okay with the fact that you're gay, be okay with the fact of do you want one embryo to go back in me or be okay with two embryos going back in me. So these are the things that are we kind of actually talk about. Another thing that's come up a lot is that people wanna know if their surrogate is COVID vaccinated or COVID not vaccinated. Um, and this has become a big thing lately in our clinic too, you know, because someone had not said that she wasn't vaccinated and the intended parents got a little upset that they didn't know that. So we're now disclosing that from the get go, because there are some people that really want to make sure that their surrogate is vaccinated or vice versa. So these are things that we're talking about. But you get to know the surrogate <coughs> and then we bring the surrogate into our clinic and do a complete evaluation of her uterus, all of her FDA testing that involves drugs, and alcohol and smoking and STDs and other things about her body that could potentially be rejecting a pregnancy. And, and so, um, so when you're saying, you know, one embryo, two embryos, I mean, what is, is there a standard, you know, what is the standard, you know, in case one doesn't take, like, do you do it one at a time? And if there is a problem, then you just go back and do it again. Or do you do multiple and just, you know, best case scenario, you get twins or triplets and worst case scenario, you get one. So in our clinic, we never put more than two embryos back. We only put one or two. If I'm ever putting two embryos back, I have a rather lengthy, detailed discussion with my patient. They have to be aware of the risks of if you put two back, first of all, one may take, maybe none will take. But if they do both take, you have a higher chance of preterm delivery you have a higher chance of preterm labor. The surrogate has a higher chance of bed rest. 
the surrogate has to be okay with carrying twins as well, not just necessarily carrying one and you just put two in without her knowing. She has to be okay with that because there's a lot more risks involved. So first of all, the surrogate has to be okay with it. But the ultimate decision, if you said I wanted twins, um, it's costly to do this. I want to do this only once. I want my kid to have a sibling. I want to go for twins. We would put two embryos back. You would pick the genders if your if you if your donor created um, embryos. Your embryos were both male and female. You would pick if you wanted the male, the female, or one of each. It's completely up to you. We never tell you what to do there. But it's up to you. Now, many people doing this alone usually put one embryo back at a time. It's a little right. difficult. Like, I don't want twins, but I, like personally, I don't want right. too so much. So if, you have, if there's only one of you, in theory, you know? if there's only one of you and you have twins, you're going to have your hands full, very, very full. Yeah. So, but I will say for a lot of our gay couples, for many people, it's important for them to try to get both of their biological children and doing it together is very special that they can both have a biological child that was has grown together in a uterus and born together. Um, but I think over time, many of my gay couples have started to do one embryo at a time, understanding that parenting isn't so easy, understanding that usually both are working men, um, also understanding the risks of having twins and also the chances of having a healthier pregnancy, just doing it one at a time. So it's become a little bit more routine, but we are still doing uh, two embryos at a time for lots of people that have, want to do twins, but we don't force it on anyone. And I never put two or more embryos back just to get a higher chance of success ever because our success rates are already rather high hitting you know, the 80 percentile. Well, so let's talk about, you know, same sex couples just in general too. you know, two men, two women, trans, whatever. Um, you know, is there any sort of technology on the horizon where two fathers can both biologically, you know, have a child that's theirs without a third person, two women, you know, what have you? So is, is that something that, you know, in theory, I would assume it's possible, but scientifically, you know, are we close to that or dream on? I don't think we're close to it. I don't think we're close to it at all because um, it was being worked on in China and, you know, it was lots of messages came out by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine that they found it to be unethical to be manipulating an embryo and putting genetic material from one embryo into another, mixing it. Um, to an extent, I think that it's unfair to be playing around with a healthy embryo and manipulating it in a scientific fashion. Uh, but I do know that there's many, many uh, intended parents of mine that have come through the clinic that have asked that question and see if it's possible. For my lesbian patients, it's a little different. And I think it's very easily to have both moms involved with one pregnancy because there's something called reciprocal IVF where we get the eggs out of one female put it with the sperm of a donor and create an embryo and then transplant the embryo with an embryo transfer into the other mom. So she and her biology and her uterus and her blood and her life create the child and deliver it. And then the egg and the embryo is created by the other partner. Um, in the gay world, it's harder because you can't really do that. So the right. closest we get to sharing biology is having a biological child made from each male partner and putting two embryos back and hoping that both take and both deliver together. Interesting. I, I just, I feel like, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I just feel like there has to be some way. And I know it's probably like, you know, the, like you said, the ethical thing, but like there should be some way that in the year 2500 or something, you know, you could take just like an egg with nothing in it and then put the X from one and the Y and the other, or the X from one and the X to the other, if you want a boy or a girl. You know, and make you know, I, that I guess it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> sometimes I have a hard time thinking of the future and what could happen. But when I think back at my life and all the things that have happened during my life, like the cell phone that my kids re re remind me that when I was a kid, you didn't even have a cell phone. Um, you know, anything's possible. You can't, when I was a kid, I didn't have a cell phone either. What are you talking about? <laughs> my kids love to rub that in. and like, you didn't even have a cell phone when you were a kid. And that's the truth. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even have a cell phone until my late 20s. Um, but with that being said, I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I just I think that it's something that ethically needs to be addressed as well, 
not just scientifically when they figure out how to do it. But I'm sure it's on the horizon, and I'm sure eventually something will happen. Uh, I just can't foresee it, and I can't think of it and how it's going to happen in my head. But I'd be curious to see how that, that opens up. Yeah. So let's say, OK, so you do one embryo at a time with your surrogate. And let's say the first one doesn't take. Does your surrogate you know, take that second embryo right off the bat? Do you find another surrogate? Is that a case by case basis? How does so that's like a really that good work? question. So many people have in their contract that, for example, they will do three tries with the same surrogate before moving on. Um, you know, we know that just because one embryo transfer didn't work in the surrogate, it doesn't make her bad and it doesn't make it that she can't work and it doesn't do well. But we would generally say that just that one cycle, you'd move on to another cycle and we could do this next cycle the next month. Uh, we could give a break if we needed to. Um, a lot of times the surrogate is not in the same town as where the clinic is. You know, we're in the heart of L.A. and in Beverly Hills. I mean, there's not a lot of our surrogates that live right in our community. So lots of people fly in and fly out to do this whole process. Uh, and with that being said, you know, we do a few different transfers. Now, I personally think if you've done three cycles of a transfer and three don't work in a surrogate, that there's something going on that we're missing. And I think it's a good time to change surrogates and move on. Um, and I assume that's the same thing, like just with any other you know, complications with pregnancy or whatever. Um, yeah, I think it's something know, that you have to pay attention to. And, you know, one thing I forgot to say is that we also have, when we have two partners, um, there have been many situations recently, it's happening more and more often, when the gay couple will actually get two different surrogates, but very close in time, because it's just much more convenient for them to raise two kids at once, rather than go through it at multiple different times during their lifetime. So we do that as right. well. Unfortunately, the financial aspect of that doubles um, and becomes a lot more complicated for people. But yeah. I did want to address the finances of this, to be honest, because that's a big part of it. And many people who want to do this are afraid to do this because of the financial aspects. And it's important for us to be able to explain, like one of the things I like to do is do this step by step. You know, don't jump into it and go and pay some agency hundred and fifty two hundred and fifty thousand dollars which they want all up front to do this process it just doesn't make any sense i think doing a consultation learning about your own fertility with how your sperm quality is and everything first step freeze your sperm second step third step look for the egg donor find an egg donor that you love create your embryo next once you've created a healthy embryo then go looking for your surrogate there is no purpose in looking for a surrogate or signing on a surrogacy agency if you don't have a healthy embryo. So I think that's really important to be completely understanding of. Make your healthy embryo first and then look for a surrogacy agency. Now, there are a lot of surrogacy agencies now. For a while, there was a major, major waiting list at many of these agencies to get a surrogate. but. Our third party concierge who helps find surrogates as well, not only egg donors, but surrogates can basically match you with a surrogate and be ready for a transfer within a month or two of being in the clinic. So and having an embryo ready to go. So I think that's kind of my opinion, the best route to take. And yeah, because I know like that, that, that there's another thing to talk about, which you keep telling me, you know, freeze your sperm, freeze your sperm. You know, we always hear, you know, women after they reach you know, they're, they're early to mid thirties. Like if they're still on the fence, maybe they want to, maybe they don't freeze your eggs, but I don't think anybody ever really talks. You don't hear people talking about like freezing your sperm, but like, what are the advantages of doing that? So, so there are actually lots of advantages for men to freeze their sperm. In your situation, John William, you know that you're going to use an egg donor and that's the route you're going to get pregnant and have a kid. So I think freezing your sperm now, while it's the healthiest, um, over the age of 40, there are lots of studies that have shown there's a higher rate of abnormal sperm. There are some weak links, and I'm not sure if they are true or not, but they say autism possibly could increase. So older sperm has been shown to be more problematic. Luckily, though, many men who get older still do have good sperm. I mean, we've had men come in their 60s and 70s and still been able to use great sperm to get pregnant. Um, but with it, that being said, the younger sperm is better off. Now, if you are a gay male who is going to need to go down the path 
of some kind of fertility treatment anyways, I think the younger you do it and leave it there waiting for yourself is probably going to be the absolute best way to do so. And there's zero yeah, downside I mean, makes, to that. It, it makes sense. It's just it's just not something you ever hear people talk about, which is interesting. You know, people should talk about men's fertility the same way we talk about women's, right? Like, I, you know, I think we have gone out of our way in our clinic to address the fact that freezing your sperm is much healthier and keeping it there. It is such a safe process for freezing sperm. Um, I don't know if most people listening know, but I have, I think, the world's record for the longest frozen sperm to create a baby. Uh, there was a gentleman um, who had had his sperm frozen for 31 and a half years and came back wow. to me with his second wife after he had grown kids and his first wife had passed away and had kids. So there's lots of... Cause that was going to be my next question is how, how long does it last once you freeze it? You know, is it like a forever thing or is there kind of a... I would know, say it's a forever date? thing. So once sperm is frozen, it kind of just goes into a holding time. Uh, there's no movement of time on it. So it's kind of a forever thing, but you got to be very smart about this. Like, do you want to come back and have your first kid when you're 70 years old? I mean, I think that's a nightmare and I think that's a, a very difficult thing to do. I'm not judging anyone that does it. I don't recommend it for anyone. Um, as a parent, I think- Well, you would know because you have like four kids. So, <laughs> so I was going to say as a parent, uh, I already feel like old and it's hard to have kids. And But I think it's absolutely true that, I mean, there's something to be said about the energy you have when you're younger raising a kid and the energy you do not have. But you also get some other benefits of patience and virtues and a lot of other things as you get older. But I, I do think it's a very personal thing that everyone should think of. There are benefits of when you're more established in life and you're older and having kids and maybe smarter in some ways, but then how long are you going to be around for your kids? There's lots of different ways of looking at this, and it's a really personal thing that I think everyone should think about and see what's right for them. Um, you know, another thing, um, it, it, kind of going back, I guess, to the genetics screening, but let's say that, um, you know, the, that the you know, the, the, the parent to be, you know, somebody like me, um, that there's discover or that there's discovered or they know, you know, that they have some sort of a genetic, you know, um, disorder, disease, what have you, you know, like something like diabetes or, um, HIV, you know, is still very present in the LGBT community, things like that, you know, um, let's talk about that traditional, right now. Traditional pregnancy isn't, you know, is automatically much more risky for those kind of people. You know, are there workarounds for those kind of things for people that? Yeah, there is. Them? So I, I, I want to say that um, there is amazing news out there uh, for HIV positive men and women trying to have families at this time. Um, there are a lot of antiviral medications that are able now to take your viral load of HIV down to an undetectable level, making it basically negative, and you are able to have beautiful kids. Um, there's clinics that do a special kind of sperm wash also on the sperm, um, kind of cleaning out any kind of potential debris that the sperm may have. So we have had beautiful pregnancies, um, and basically the surrogate had to take a pill prep, just like gay men take for safe sex, but the prep pill yep. was given to our surrogate mm -hmm. daily um, to decrease her chance of ever being able to get HIV. Uh, the parent was in great health and undetectable. The sperm was used, beautiful embryo was made, and she carried the pregnancy to term. And there's lots of studies out there that have had, there's thousands of surrogates that have carried HIV positive men's children and done incredibly well. Yeah. And I mean, but that's really important because I think a lot of people and it's not just HIV, but, you know, that's obviously, you know, one of the more prevalent um, diseases in the LGBT community. But, you know, people think that it's a death sentence, which it's not. And um, people may think that that means that because they have it, they automatically, you know, will pass it to their children. But it, but there are ways to kind of we have we have come a long way in science. Um, and for people that are not aware of all the changes and the things that have happened in the HIV medical world, I would highly suggest that they get on the computer and read because there's so much great information out there. But you said something about like diabetes. So we're not able to, for example, take something like diabetes out of your, your chain of genetics. But 
if you have a disorder that is linked to a chromosome, so for example, in the Caucasian population, cystic fibrosis is the most commonly passed on genetic disorder. Um, in the African American population, sickle cell is one of the most common. Uh, in Mediterranean uh, people, an ancestry like thalassemia, which is a kind of anemia, is very common. If two partners do carry those disorders, the gen there is a special genetic testing that's done along with IVF. So not only do we check the 46 chromosomes to make sure that the embryo is healthy, but we also do something called single gene mutation testing. And the single gene mutation testing actually checks to see the embryo that we're putting back in you does not carry that disease. So you can screen the embryo for certain things. It's not that you can manipulate the embryo to have traits or what have you, but you can screen them to be like, okay, if you have nine embryos, one of them has whatever, you know, one of these genetic linked diseases is, you can eliminate that embryo basically. You know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that is definitely something that you can do. Um, and the technology uh, for that has actually really come a long way now. Really, really come a long way. Yeah, well, that's reassuring for a lot of people to hear, though. It is. Know? It is actually very reassuring. Um, and that has allowed us to be able to have a lot of healthy babies for a lot of healthy uh, couples out there. And I am really glad that you have given thought to this. And you finally, some of the uh, pressure I put on you to think about this is making a little dent. So that makes me really happy. Um, if anyone's listening, John William is single, and you can reach oh, out to him. Uh, John <laughs> William, if someone's trying to find where <laughs> you or want to follow you on social media, can you let everyone know how to find you? Yeah, uh, your best bet is Instagram. I do check my DMs most days. Um, my handle is my name, at J.W. Barger, B-A-R-G-E-R. -E um, so, yeah, follow along. I mean, catch me if you can. I, I'm. This is my biggest problem is not, you know, the, the, the process doesn't intimidate me. It's that, you know, I have to change my lifestyle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, you have a very, very busy lifestyle. And there's going to be a kid that's really going to either enjoy or absolutely hate traveling the world as much as you do. Uh, but I have a feeling well, they're going to absolutely enjoy it. And I can tell you for sure, I, I can almost guarantee that that kid is going to be one of the luckiest kids in this world because you are a lovely, lovely human being. Um, the apple does not fall too far from the tree. And uh, I've been lucky enough to know your mom really well. And uh, she would be really proud that we're having this discussion now. Very. Oh, I know. Well, trust me, if she was still around, she'd be sitting right next to me, button in. Like that, that <laughs> is, under the table. <laughs> that is absolutely right. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for being on the Fertile Life podcast. It means a lot yeah, to me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and it has been a pleasure to have you. Um, and uh, we want to thank you again for being here and for everyone who is listening.